session. circumstance and reason. Daniel, as you know, uh, is based in Milan, has been based in Milan for several years now, and is soon to depart again uh, for the west coast of the United States, where he's taking up a residentship with the Getty Foundation. Uh, it would be nice to talk about Daniel at some length, but I'm sure there's no need to introduce him to you here tonight, and I should remind you that there's another room full of people in the back block who are quite anxious for this evening to begin. So I'm going to call on Daniel without any ceremony. Daniel. Thank you, Alvin. I'm, I'm delighted to be here. I have uh, so many friends here, Alvin and Dalibor and uh, Donald Bates, who collaborated with me on a project, uh, Raul. Uh, I see so many. It, it's really fantastic to be back here. I'm here for a short time, so I have really nothing important to say. <laughs> uh, and really, what I really wanted to do is, is rather address myself to the situation in architecture, but it's pretty difficult. Uh, and I, I remember re reading once uh, Rabbi Hillel who, in order to test his disciples or students, uh, asked them to describe the cosmogony while standing on one leg. This was really the, 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 the basis of it. And I think it was a damn good one, because if you can't say something that quickly, it's about cosmogony. And if it's longer, it's academic, um, well, academic and not really reliable. But uh, I'm sure that, uh, that one would be expected to explain uh, and, and, and describe one's work in certain, in a certain methodological rigor, certain causality, certain relationship between fact and figure, certain consistency of rhetoric. Uh, but I have to tell you honestly that I've given up this method of presenting my work as I've developed the work because I noticed that it really didn't make any difference. And I'm using the word any difference, not as a difference of the difference, but just that it doesn't really make a difference within the discourse of what is actually the same. Now, clearly architecture can go by its name, by a saying, by a mirror, by a crown, by an interface, an aspect, a power, a light, even something like a limb or a amputated organ. Uh, however, all of uh, this type of speaking about it would still revolve about the point of where I feel we, collectively, those who practice architecture and those who don't, are vis-a-vis -vis the contemporary reality. And I think, I certainly feel that we are at the end of architecture. Uh, that it's basically over. Uh, and I, I know in 1979, uh, when I uh, published my first little catalog here at the AA with Alvin's uh, blessing called End Space, I tried to address myself to this uh, issue, uh, which I thought would be a, a quick one. You know, if something is over, it's, it's over. One can, uh, one can diagnose the situation and, and call it quits. But uh, I've discovered uh, in the years, uh, in the 10 years at least since that particular work, that being over, if not a beginning, is an incredibly prolonged state. Uh, prolonged infinitely, in fact, and prolonged indefinitely, of course, depending on the resilience of the soul. In a sense, I, I feel that, that the work uh, that I'm pursuing, and also that others, uh, who are my colleagues, friends, and people whom I admire today, is a work of basically is straightening a circle. Uh, I know much has been said about the circle in contemporary philosophy, but to actually straighten a circle, to unfold it, to uncurl it onto a flat line, 
indefinitely prolonged and infinitely patiently prolonged, uh, involve one, involves one back again in a circle, but this time a circle bereft, eternally bereft of its center. And uh, having no center and having no place, uh, one has to see the end of things, in particular the end of architecture, as a qualified uh, matter, not uh, straightforward. Because in the typology of ends, uh, as I have understood it and thought to myself, uh, there, are at least, uh, there is at least a four-dimensional structure, one of which would uh, be the end of architecture in a very simple way, an end uh, in which uh, the content, uh, the form, uh, the spirit of architecture simply reaches its terminal point. It runs out. Uh, it reaches a boundary, a limit, an edge, and then it would be the end. Uh, but as I uh, started working with this idea of an end and reaching a limit or a goal, uh, or simply a road which would uh, no longer exist, I discovered that that was not really uh, the end of architecture. It was one of the possible terminal stages of architecture. John Haydock would, would have called it a pathological state. And Peter, Peter Eisenhower, perhaps a deconstructed stage, but it is only a stage and one dimension. Certainly the other dimension of architecture that one is involved in, as an architect and as a being uh, who is geared towards ends, uh, is certainly an architecture which is ended because it is fulfilled, because it brings together to coherence all the trajectory of its, uh, and its pathos uh, to a fruition. And in that sense, every fruition uh, is an end as fulfillment. And that is also, of course, a dimension of, uh, of the end, uh, as I see it, of architecture, that, that it fulfills indeed, it fulfills itself in bringing together those aspirations, uh, which, by the way, are not really even millennial. But that is only the second uh, structure, second dimension of the end, as, of course, terminal being is a dimension of its end. The third uh, point, the, the third uh, structure of end, uh, would be a kind of very contemporary, uh, perhaps even a nihilistic ending to architecture, which is architecture as a resourceful and extreme possibility of bringing together extremity of possibility into architecture. And that would be a kind of possibility that would, in any case, outstrip the wild, wildest reality in which one is involved. A kind of possibility that itself is a closure. Uh, in Heideggerian terms, this would be seen, for example, as the death of architecture, as the kind of death which even empirical end of technology would be unable to fulfill, since it has already been outstripped in the closure by the entire movement of architecture. And that is the third dimension of this end. And then, of course, there is the fourth end, uh, which we experience all the time. The end as a transgressive, as a total shifting together, or total shifting away, a ty type of displacement where in the original becomes unoriginal, and the immensity of the unoriginality outpaces both reason and capacity to deal with. I'm sorry if I'm uh, delving uh, in a seemingly uh, a casual way into the end, but all I want to say is that the end of architecture, <coughs> as I see it and as I think others experience it as well, is uh, not something which is uh, truly, which can truly be over. Uh, and even though it is not an end as a beginning, it is certainly an entering into a realm which will be different, uh, different from uh, the 2,000 or 3,000 year old tradition uh, of architecture. Now, of course, that is a lot, uh, speaking about a 3,000 year old tradition, or maybe even a longer one. Uh, but given that, that uh, one knows uh, historically at least 50 or 60,000 years of, of writing, uh, of difference, of structure, 
uh, of embodiment, uh, even an end to this seemingly invulnerable tradition uh, would not be something to bemoan. And perhaps I feel, as do others, that Western, the Western way of thinking about the problem with these typologies and these clarities is to be taken differently after we have experienced certain facts. I think it is uh, Blanchot who speaks uh, relative to the concentration camps and, yeah, relative to the concentration camps specifically. He says that uh, we are all survivors with one difference, with a difference that we cannot die any longer, since the death possibility of authentic dying has been removed and is no longer even a human fact. Now, death, architecture, ending, terminus, fulfillment, possibility, extremity, transgression, seem to be apocalyptic uh, notions. Um, and they are, since uh, I believe that, uh, that we are always already living in an end. Uh, perhaps modern architecture recognizes it less than it was recognized in the traditional thought, and particularly in non-Western thought, but uh, I uh, would not retract uh, that the apocalypse is not necessarily connected with the coming of uh, the year 2000 and so on, but is indeed here to stay and to develop and to take on its own coloration, its own name, its own mirroring, its own interface, its own shoot, its own dismemberment. And, of course, there is a vocabulary that has been developed, uh, diagnostic vocabulary, but, but still, the, the, the notion, which I think is a motivating notion, certainly in my uh, work, and in those works I refer to by alluding to them, that there is a contraction in architecture. Call it closure, call it uh, four dimensional. There is a contraction. And in this contraction, a withdrawal, not of God, but of, of architecture. A withdrawal, not of the gods, but of the very thing one is pursuing. And in this withdrawal, and in this uh, collapse, compression, there is also, <coughs> to use another widely used word, a clearing and emptying out an opening of a of a place but it's an opening under spe special circumstances an opening which can no longer be simply called the breaking of the vessel as it was called in the Kabbalah the breaking of the meaning and the escape and and also a kind of uh, unbreakable ves vessel in which no tikkun or no restoration or no restitution can come about by any magical or occult means, by wishing that it did, by hoping <coughs> that it did. I think it perhaps sounds all too clear uh, as I, as I I'm, I'm speaking this, uh, maybe it sounds too, uh, I, I think it does sound contrived because it begins to suggest that there is a direct relationship between theory and practice. And it begins to imply that theory and practice indeed exist. Uh, I would uh, venture to say that uh, I have no theory and I believe the limits of theory are upon us. That uh, the theory and practice, that uh, little word and, uh, the reconciliation in ideological terms of being and becoming is uh, just a word and that in fact one is rather in a situation where no such coming together is to be expected. And that leaves uh, architecture without theory and it leaves practice without practice. And. Uh, Often I'm criticized or attacked uh, that my work uh, is not architecture. And sometimes I think 
Maybe it's better to say that it is really not architecture if one means architecture peppered by the theory. Sometimes, of course, it is attacked as a theoretical work, and I then would say that uh, it is really uh, also a non-theoretical or not theoretical work. Uh, and it's a work uh, which one would even not call in-between work. That's another uh, popular word today. The in-between has become a place to be. But uh, even in between is, is, uh, is just another term because there is no such place uh, as the in between. Uh, what I'm trying to say that whatever system uh, I am uh, using, it is an attempt not to have it. And whatever not a system, uh, which is implied by the development of the work which I will try to describe, is also an attempt at making the not system into something which becomes systematic. So uh, to work uh, without a system and without a not system is something I'm trying to do. Now, Paul Valéry said that the writer is a creature, every writer, every great writer, is a creature who is imprisoned in a small cell, pacing indefinitely between four words. I was very impressed that every writer is in a small cell pacing indefinitely between four words. And uh, I think, even though uh, this may not sound too optimistic, uh, it is also certainly my experience that, that the architect, uh, without being imprisoned, is today bound to walk uh, between four names, four numbers, four geometric forms, four mirrors, four garments, four crowns, and you can supply the rest of the rhetorically fractured fourness. But I think it is the era of the four. And I know that Derrida has written some very interesting things, as did Heidegger, about the number four. Uh, but I still think they're far away uh, in flattening the circle completely. Uh, because the four reforms itself as did the three. And if one is interested in the non-fourness uh, and does not go back to the threesome and the twosome and to the one, but rather prolongs this quest towards the other direction, one would at least be in a miniature cage. I don't uh, really have had this problem because I used to sometimes speak and point to my work. That is pointing seems uh, actually pointless because there is no relationship between what I'm saying now and the work. I'm trying. Uh, I'm aware of the lack of relationship. I'm, I'm also aware of the, my own incapacity to put this relationship to work. By the way, I feel that this is not a matter of a gift or talent or genius. That this relationship is not something which is totally controllable simply because we desire it, simply because we want to have this relationship with architecture, with space, with time. and. Uh, Perhaps what is given to one today is to take care of that which does not have that relationship. Because it too needs to be taken care of. I mean, not only the things that are worthy of being ca taken care of need care, but also things that are, or traditionally have been seen as unworthy of care, need care. It's awkward, but I, I'll, I'll try because I was fortunately invited to a competition and participated in it, and uh, I was able to prolong uh, the movement into other spheres, which, by the way, I don't find any more real. Now people tell me, hey, this is great. Now you're doing real. Now you're involved really in architecture. And even Mr. Jenks included me in the real architecture of today. But I believe I am really not uh, in the real architecture. I, I think it's sh a shrinking horizon, including 
that withdrawal of programmatic and uh, political discourse, which I think we all experience, whether we are students or practicing architects or writers or whatever, writers of books. Perhaps uh, it's possible to have the slides with the light on still, without uh, going into darkness. It would be, if it's seen, can, can you see it? Uh, this was a, uh, a, um, a really contracted uh, view of architectural uh, program and of architectural space. The contraction or withdrawal altogether in Berlin. And I, I was fascinated and, and thankful that I was given the opportunity to so to speak, be in Berlin, work in Berlin, because Berlin, I think, really is not a place. And I, you know, it's not a place, uh, not anymore. And I found myself familiar with it, even though I have never been uh, to Berlin before. I realized that I've been to Berlin for a long time, uh, that everybody soon will have been to Berlin for a long time. And I took it really not so much as an entity to be found in a certain geogra geography of Europe in what Nietzsche called this peninsula of Asia, but rather took Berlin as a model of the architectural condition. Since it seemed to me that to cut through that model would also cut through the very heart of the desire, aspiration, and it would be a true section of the experience. Uh, I also, by the way, did not share the goals of IBA, uh, especially after seeing the results, that I felt that Berlin was uh, being really, uh, you know, when one was deluded about being able to rebuild the city today, rebuild it along particularly 19th century or 18th century lines. And I was given these two blocks uh, in the competition and felt that the best response uh, I could make is to suggest that uh, Berlin uh, does not rebuild itself, since the problem of rebuilding is not a problem of redoing. Uh, of course, uh, given this, what I, what I spoke about, uh, this typology of withdrawal, the break, and the restoration, uh, this can only happen uh, elsewhere, but not really on a deconsecrated uh, ground. So I felt that, that uh, anyway, there was enough uh, rebuilding of Berlin that it would be good to leave Berlin, in a way, uh, in its own history, since this history it was not given by anyone. I know that RAF and American Air Force did a lot of the planning in Berlin, but uh, this is not a small factor in the, in the, well, in a kind of a holocaust. And, you know, I was on the other side in the holocaust, but. I believe that the Holocaust, as I said, is a, not something one can get away from, even if one lives somewhere still, or in a place which, yeah, which has a kitchen, a home, a hearth. Anyway, I think it has, it's there too. This uncanny placelessness, this place which will not be restored, this place which is at the end, and one should not bemoan it, uh, is illustrated therefore here and I felt that one should find the line and one should find the Archimedean point kind of a lever and a point but I could not find the Archimedean point I, I searched uh, as far as I could even in myself and I just didn't have anything to hitch this line on uh, there was just no such substance where architecture could be lodged and revolved uh, infinitely far all I found was um, a series of other disconnected lines, a series of other uh, pretended Archimedean points, a series of, or a web, I should say, of misleading and deluded ideological statements about the world. And to unname them, to demirror them, to, to go the other way, so to speak, to the negativity of the process, is something actually I'm very interested in. You know, Franz Kafka, in one of his brilliant uh, pieces, uh, or his notebooks, he said, the positive has been given. It's now time to accomplish the negative. And I never quite understood what he meant, the, pos you know, the, the positive was given. It was here. 
now the accomplishment of the negative. It certainly was not a nihilistic statement. It was certainly nothing to laugh about. It was not negative. It was really the castle. It was really the trial. And the fact that the judgment uh, in those terms is not something which is at the end of time, but it is the youngest day of all, as he said. Well, I discovered uh, many lines. And in fact, uh, this particular site, block 270 and 271 of IBA, intersected with the old uh, master plan for Berlin, uh, which the Speer plan, uh, the north-south axis. And when I saw that, I said, you know, really that, that what I should do as an architect is to make a clear collision, so withdraw completely so that the north-south historical axis of Berlin will never again be a section of this web. Now, you can say it, I tried to block the north-south development, but I wouldn't even say I tried to block it because there's nothing to block since it's all a vacuum and it's all empty, it's going nowhere. It was rather to, yeah, to look at the two lines uh, very closely and to get into them. I think it's one thing to look at the line, the other thing is to get into it, to get into a line, and of course then to be a line. I, I was very uh, thrilled when I saw uh, a photograph of Philip Johnson with the Rochenko book in front of him. But, uh, you know, what I was more interested in is that Rochenko, you know, when he wrote the line, he became a line, yeah, he kind of, also Tattle and all these uh, so-called constructivists, they all became lines, lines lines of the text, uh, lines which one has to read in between. And knowing this condition then, uh, getting into the line, not into the row, not into the lineup, but right into it, uh, is actually the manifesto, so to speak, because I thought that this is a chance for a global manifesto. Then the line is going through Tokyo, it's going through New York, it's going through Omaha, Nebraska, I was in Stuttgart, same, the same line is going, and it's only one line. And uh, you can say the line is infinitely long. The line is millions and billions of units uh, dense, uh, but uh, all the zeros of the line continue, uh, in my experience, to add up to no more than a zero. And that's really fantastic that, that all the great figures that we have, and the greater they are, the more zeros they have, uh, the more one realizes that, uh, you know, a zero, doesn't matter how many you have of them, you can have it in the billions or in the trillions, cannot be uh, or add up more than a zero. So zeros and lines, withdrawal, contraction, the break, and uh, not as Stanley Tagerman would have it, a reparable wound or irreparable wound, but no wound at all. Next, please. And. Uh, I felt that rather than giving uh, the materials, you know, so, you know, site plans and all this thing that were required, one should rather construct a non-elementary uh, yeah, a kind of a, a fetish, an icon, something that uh, one would not have to relate only intellectually to, uh, something that one could measure in other spheres, and something that by its own nature would digest all the materials that one was interested in. Um, so I have to say uh, that uh, I did send back to Berlin everything that was sent to me. You know, they sent a lot from Berlin. Uh, you know, packages and packages, you get a lot of this stuff. And I felt uh, morally obliged uh, to send back everything. Uh, not to keep a single uh, nothing, uh, to stay at zero. And that's not easy, because it's one thing to send drawings back, one thing, but, but uh, I started on a quest to send back everything, and I'm still involved in it. Next, please. Next, please. Uh, by saying uh, that I uh, sent back everything, you know, I, I tried, to, I have to tell you how it happened, and, and Donald Bates, who, who was my associate, uh, sitting in the front row here, can collaborate. You know, we, we were, sort of sitting and saying, you know, all these incredible materials, but the materials don't end with what is asked for. One has also materials already from Berlin, you know, in one's library, in one's drawer, 
you know, it's all over. There is no end, even in Milan, to, to, to these materials. So I said, well, it's time now to use them. And I know uh, this is uh, one thing to say, like, use all your books for a change. Stop referring to them, right? I mean, stop just, you know, referring theoretically to the books or using them for quotations. Yeah, use them. I didn't have such a good idea how to use them, but one of the things I uh, figured, uh, as did my associate, was uh, w would be, you know, we could process the books. Uh, we could, uh, in some sense, destroy them, cut them up, if we were to memorize uh, their full content. So you take a book, you know, off your shelf, and I started this when I did the Biennale project, you know, because I was very much admiring this uh, Cervantes notion that a gentleman should only have eight books. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, the texts proliferate. As Derrida says, you know, even the unwritten text now I I is something that cannot be ended. I mean, think about it. The, the unwritten text is even longer than the one that has been written. So uh, here, uh, what I did, and I think it doesn't look like much. These are big objects. but. Do you know that the entire memorized version of James Joyce writing is here? And it doesn't amount to more than about six meters by, s by you know, two meters. No, because it looks like you could have a lot of it. Uh, you could, you know, you know, Finnegan's Wake could last you a lifetime. But I think empirically not. You could memorize it as we did, uh, word for word, and it doesn't take a big space. And, uh, of course, then one realizes that the books aren't there. Anyway, uh, Louis Grouin, the, the French uh, anthropologist, says that writing from its beginning is just a series of notches which have no reference to representation. He says that the first writing is a series of notches which is already fully knowledgeable about itself. And there goes all the professors of, uh, you know, linguistics who have been trying to decipher them into, you know, more primitive primal codes. Next, please. Uh, so between uh, telephone books, uh, uh, you know, foreign language, uh, you know, I mean, Russian telephone books in particular, names, addresses, uh, one does not easily run out. And I have to say that uh, no drawing was produced for this uh, competition. These were, you know, not drawings, they were sent in plastic, you know, like you get for a competition. And uh, no drawing was made. All that was uh, made was a, a sort of a restitution of the material to itself. The line to line, name to name, uh, mirror to mirror. Next, please. Uh, now, if each uh, point is not a point, if each line, therefore, is not a line, if each geometry is not representational, if each thing is continually becoming something else without ever falling, in my experience at least, into something that's going somewhere, <laughs> except towards its own end, then one actually can discover another way in which the mapping, the coding, the decoding is not a recoding, <laughs> is not a remapping, but is actually a, a staying, staying, a kind of insomnia of architecture, which happens even during daytime. Now, please, no, uh, it, it's, it, I don't mean by the word insomnia to, to yeah, that's better. <laughs> well, maybe that's a little bit too much light, but <laughs> can slides still be seen? The next, please. Maybe slightly less light, but not too little. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, yeah. Really, there is no way to control light. Uh, I was in Stuttgart just a couple of weeks ago and they couldn't find a light switch at a lecture. You know, they had no light, and I said, I have no slides. I didn't bring any slides. And they all expected slides, and I said, uh, is there any light? They called six or seven technicians from the university. <laughs> you know, as a center of Porsche and uh, Mercedes. And 
I don't kid you, they couldn't find the light switch. <laughs> then at the end of the lecture, after it was finished, because the lecture took place in complete darkness, <laughs> uh, one of the technicians said they finally found the light. Uh, next, please. And next, please. But I, I, I'm trying to, I, I guess I'm not, next, please. To communicate to you that it's not about the objects or the things. These are actually rather more like documents of a certain type of experience. And I think architecture is a document. It's a, a text, as it has been called. It, it's something which is left behind, uh, if it is good. Uh, it's left behind. And as a residue, uh, it perhaps contains something far more important, which is the inner core or inner face of an experience which is caught in it. And I think that's what good architects that I appreciate have always done. They have exposed the documentation of that inner core. And I, by the way, believe that that inner core was not any more fulfilled in ancient times. I believe that there was never really any Greek architecture or any Gothic architecture or any Egyptian pyramids. I don't believe that there was ever any phenomena of this sort. I, I believe that this was a creation of 19th century historiography. And I'm yet to find one person who can point to me a, you know, a Greek temple, a, 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 you know, an ancient site. Uh, I think it's a fiction. It's a fantastic fiction that has been fabricated for the sake of illusion. Uh, which I think one should quickly lose, uh, that there was never such a thing. There was never a, you know, man, the old man playing the guitar, uh, you know, in the blue light. Uh, next, please. Next, please. Uh, and there are different things. I mean, they sent a map, but they only sent a map of Europe. Uh, you know, I figured Berlin goes farther than that. And uh, knowing that Alberti and all these uh, venerable architects have always engaged themselves in the problem of mapping, uh, we made a map, a map, and you know, it's a lot of yellow. It's not just the bad slides, but there's a lot of desert, a lot more desert, and a lot of blue, actually, a lot of uh, sea. Uh, but, uh, you know, to try to make a map, uh, not in order to find one's orientation, but rather to know where one already is not. And that's something very practical. I did not do anything which, we did not do anything which was not practical in terms of grasping, grasping, how can you grasp emptiness? You know, how can you touch it? It's not even human because the human being is not fulfilled enough to be full of emptiness. Uh, devices and methods, uh, experiments. Next, please. <coughs> and yet, I think the important thing is to do it with rigor. And to do it in a ritual state which does not have any theological uh, leftover. I think even the god of uh, Rabbi Luria functioned as God only because he was painfully rigorous. And I think it's true for all the derivatives of the Old Testament, which includes certainly Christianity and Muslim thought. And I think uh, the problem is the same also in Eastern architecture. Next, please. And next one. <coughs> next one. Next one, please. Next, please. I was, uh, a little bit amazed that uh, my good friend Peter Eisenman yesterday showed a perspective, I was told, 
uh, and perspective with, with Miss Vanderbilt, apparently. That, uh, did you see? I, I was amazed because I don't know if you can, you can, I mean, I don't think you can gather it together, even through Miss Vanderbilt, back into that success. Uh, unless you're really successful at dying. And I think this notion of uh, Heraclitus, mortal, immortal, you know what, mortal, immortal, immortal, mortal, I think it's just uh, that many words, because I don't think these two words go together. <laughs> mortal, immortal. Uh, I think this is something to think about, since uh, architecture as a sacrificial uh, operation has pretended for maybe 5,000 years that its sacrificial, uh, sacramental <coughs> nature will somehow save it from the rigor of its own contraction. Next, please. So it's not exactly like throwing dice. It's not exactly like the chance, uh, the Mallarmean chance of the ocean and of the throw. Uh, because I don't think one, as an architect, has even that throw and that ocean. Uh, one rather doesn't have it. Uh, and the chance doesn't even play the liberating element. Uh, I don't think one could use chance in architecture. Uh, anymore. It's as good as order. Next, please. The next one. The next one, please. But all I want to say that the whole thing is in section. In section going through, through. It's not in section going through the bricks only. But I, 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 I can tell you and I will show you more the materialization of the building, which is not in the future, but is already in this, uh, this material. Next, please. And somebody asked me about, you know, why it's 5.87 degrees. Uh, it was just the average, uh, the average, the average inclination. The average, and, and then I discovered, you know, when I went to the Tower of Pisa, that it's 587 which was the average inclination because it was built that way. You know that. The Leaning Tower of Pisa was actually built as a leaning tower, which means that it was always just the Tower of Pisa. The leaning part was not, was not, uh, yeah, it was just, just a misleading <laughs> adjective. But it was the average inclination. Next, please. Next one. And this was, uh, I mean, one had to go into sort of other discourses vis-a-vis -vis this inclination, but uh, it is never getting somewhere, so to speak. One gets into a thinner and thinner spatiality, a thinner place. And it's, the building is actually not that thin, but it's got a, a folding inside and also, there, therefore, it, it externalizes itself into a, so a type of new circulation and new wheeling around. Next, please. And uh, the little train. Uh, this is next to the station where Walter Benjamin missed his train. Uh, it's true, actually. Uh, also, where Miss Vandero had uh, his incredible uh, revolving skyscraper experiment, you know, he used to hang out glass out of his window and look at its rotation on 24 um, Crossbar, which I got very interested because I thought that Ms. Vanderoe therefore should come into the project and I suggested that the IBA develop a parking lot uh, directly opposite this uh, Fortbildstrasse city edge uh, and I am hopeful that the city of Berlin will continue to develop this uh, Point, but uh, the point of Ms. Vanderoe's uh, 24-arm Carlsbad studio and the Spear axis and the 
axis of this uh, average inclination is that they do meet and revolve in this strange space, which I would say is uh, the end of modernity, isn't it? I mean, because they were all postmodern. Speer, Mies, and certainly I would consider myself. Next, please. And fire. I had to study a lot of fire regulations to get uh, the permits to do all these things. Uh, and, you know, Berlin is full of fire regulations. They are uh, leading exponents because they've, uh, they know about fire. <coughs> I think, uh, in that sense, it's something that rejoins my own interest in Berlin because it's the Heraklitean cosmos, you know, in quotes, in its real way. I mean, one doesn't have to, you know, sort of go to California to see fire, like uh, the sunsets and uh, the real fire is in the fire regulation. And I uh, have to say that we all did become extremely interested in it. And I never thought five years ago that I would be telling Alvin that I'm interested in fire regulations, but I am. <laughs> Next, please. <laughs> and I didn't just send uh, the obvious uh, materials, but the ones that I had, as, as I said, in the drawer. I felt that everything, uh, you know, everything, you know, the book itself, which was a hammer. I mean, the book is a hammer, isn't it? Every, you know, every book is, is, is the biggest hammer of all. The, the books are the explosive, dynamite, fire regulating things. The rest is uh, inert in comparison. So I think every, book is an explosion every hammer therefore is the book and i always admired the russians because they worked with hammers in their hands and knees you know he was a mason and bricklayer and all these things and uh, i figured this would be a good uh, way to get into it to get into practice so uh, it, it, it's a i'm describing to you the adventure of, of practice which by the way is not something that is getting clearer as, as, as I practice. Uh, I, I told also Alvin that I've been, I cannot show you the two last uh, projects that I've been working on, one for Japan and one uh, in another city because they're anonymous sort of competitions. But uh, I discovered after working on them that, you know, one was getting lost. You know, starting with these premises, one is getting more and more, not into the clear light of day and sort of get on with it, but it's becoming more obscure. And I think, it's good to accept obscurity. I, I think it's going to, I think architecture is going to get more obscure, not more obscurantist or sort of, you know, of course, theories will be written would be more and more indecipherable. But nevertheless, architecture as a human quest, uh, I think uh, will finally get completely lost. And uh, I, I think it's getting lost uh, already, not just in the anonymity of technological and instrumental know-how, but it's getting lost in its own terms. One does not have to go to the computer realm. One can meditatively get lost. And I advise you, if you're not lost, to try to get lost. You know, uh, I would uh, ask you, as someone who is really your contemporary, uh, not, I, I don't wish you to find your way out. You know, the way out architecture. No, the way in uh, it is, uh, I think, uh, the reversal and, and the turn of architecture is, I think, that it is getting, you know, it's not going to the outer space, uh, despite all the launchings. It's going, reversing itself, and uh, even though it's perhaps not going to the inner space, it's going in. Next, please. So, uh, that much for the redundancy of the book. And then I continued with 24 on um, Carlsbad. I tried to put the entire Berlin into a formula of a line where one could squeeze the entire city sort of by its neck and squeeze it and then align it, realign it, bury it, uh, give it a proper burial, not an improper one. And uh, this is also a lease, uh, a lease on clean air the fresh air corridor. Uh, so uh, it, this is uh, the next step of it, to, to try to seal it in, to seal the name, 
to seal the to seal the word to seal it completely inside because one thing is to send it back then you have to seal it in the second level of the end next please sealing uh, sealing it in making it invulnerable or at least trying to get towards the invulnerability uh, is a more proletarian engagement and uh, there are not too many models for it at least in the last few years of architecture so it's an attempt next please Uh, and uh, sealing it in, you know, putting all the words now uh, back so that one would no longer pronounce them. <laughs> you know, one is trying not to pronounce the words, not to, not to have them around. Uh, one thing is to send James Joyce back to Dublin, Malevich back to, you know, Petersburg, uh, Walter Benjamin, you know, back to Jerusalem. But to actually not no longer to be exposed to the hazardous fallout, to the radiate, to the radium. So I'm trying to protect myself from the effects of radiation. Uh, it's something uh, I think uh, one needs to do. Next, please. Uh, it's a very thin uh, kind of a wing, extremely thin. Thin. It's it's on the other side only a millimeter uh, section, and it's actually. I submitted this to the planning uh, authority in Berlin as, actually, you know, because they said you didn't draw the section of the building. You know, you've dealt, you know, the, all these drawings, abstract, museum, modern art, but, you know, what about how it's going to be built? So I gave them this thing accurate and, uh, you know, it's an engineering piece. Next, please. Uh, and in the engineered uh, work, uh, the tubes are full, you know, it's connected uh, to, to you know the support systems, um, it's uh, it's it's pra most pragmatic, uh, because I'm not trying to do the working drawings in the normal way. I mean, I try to uh, you know one one fails at it, uh, because you know there you know there's no work anymore. Yeah, so you know, always want to a working drawing. Uh, you know what I mean? There's no work. Uh, there's no work to be had. Uh, there are no jobs. Next one, please. So to avoid the working drawing meth methodology and to try to go sl slightly further into this not theory, not practice, uh, to still be in it. It's hard. I, I, I hope uh, you, you accept that it's, it's a difficult test. Uh, and it's it's a, it's a, it's a test. It's a bet. Next, please. It's a test when one dispenses with the truth, since the truth was had. I think perhaps <coughs> the rabbinical schools. Uh, which uh, I think created the secular world. Now, not just Rabbi Luria, who's very, you know, in at uh, Yale and critical theory, but I think Spinoza especially, uh, I think was responsible for creation of the secular world, and I believe that the Jewish uh, thought, uh, as it uh, came out of the yeshiva and the uh, cheder, uh, and became uh, properly in its place, uh, also in part is responsible for the creation of modernity, right up to Newton and beyond. Uh, so I offer this uh, not just as a track into, into nowhere, but uh, as I said, a section also through one's own complete experience. Next, please. The knife blade. Uh, the razor, um, and of course the the illegibility, which is also illusory since it is perfectly legible. One can read it. I mean, there is no such thing as illegible text. This is where I would take uh, in, uh, exception to both Chumis and uh, Eisenmans and Derrida's uh, rhetorical devices because they they really believe in the unknown, uh, which I think is a relic of. Uh, some other 
era. Uh, I don't believe uh, in that sense in the unknown. I think the unknown also ceased. Uh, yeah. Gave in. Next. So I tried to collect all the handwritings, uh, all the, uh, you know, everything that I could get screwed into the entire uh, operation to screw it in so it would not get lost. And, uh, you know, uh, this uh, Mies van der the only different thing uh, than the volume here at the AA library is that it's actually signed by Mies, this one. It's not printed. Next, please. Uh, how to get uh, one's signature, uh, one's belated uh, sign, and also how to dispense with it uh, is part of this process. Uh, now, what is the rigor? The rigor is that of screwing the screws, of unwriting the writing, of hammering, of uh, rewriting, uh, remembering, replicating. It's certainly not a quest uh, after the original. Next, please. And I have to say that I did, uh, you know, learn a lot about screwing the screws. You know, and I didn't do it before. I don't know how many of you have ever screwed in a screw. Uh, how many of you have ever rewritten exactly the signature? And that's a document, because that's what they were about. Next, please. And and it's still available, I think in some uh, tr totally transcendent manner that one can... I mean, the only thing I'm proud about, this map of Berlin, uh, is a complete uh, sort of project of this XY axis of the Spear at uh, IBA works, is that uh, it contains as many screws as could be screwed into a minimum area. Uh, if I asked you how many screws are here, you'd say 20, 30, 100. Uh, you wouldn't believe, probably, if I told you there were 4,000, 5,000 screws. Because it's dead, you know, it's just like with the James Joyce. It looks like it's so thick, but it's very thin. Next, please. You can stop counting if you don't believe me. <laughs> but also, this is uh, documentation for the building department in Berlin. Uh, because, you know, once you do that section, you got to you know, you've got to know how to do this section. You can't just represent your knowledge in some dream world of hypothetical fulfillment, since the fulfillment is closed. Uh, then one has to do it here. And, and I have to tell you, this is not collaged, or, you know, the writing is not so cleverly transcribed by, you know, heliographic or laser methods. It's rewritten completely. And it's all the writings that I ever had on Berlin, you know, which, uh, curiously enough, were not written by the Germans. A lot of, uh, you know, Irish, English, Blake, for example, and uh, Russians, uh, even Chinese, uh, did a lot of it. Uh, it's a beginning. I mean, the panel is not that big. It's only as big as this room, but uh, it, it's a beginning. Next, please. <laughs> well, I show you also the misleading. Uh, see, I, I kept it. I don't want to lie to you, I want to show you everything, you know, because that's what I did early, so I showed it to you now, late. What's early is always late. What's late comes before. Next, please. So I started learning, you know, how to be useful, how to make the more useful, the more useful document. Uh, so this has become to be a little bit better. Next, please. Next one, please. And this is even later. By the way, this was done in order to have a, a not a dialogue with me. I don't think you can have a dialogue with me. And I don't think you can have a dialogue with modern architecture. Uh, but you can see something in the change of expression and uh, that's how I evolved the work. I evolved the work by the changing expression 
You know, when I started, uh, the Mies uh, was smiling, and it was fantastic. It was like a positive uh, remark. But towards the end, you know, look at this photograph. It's, it's a di another, I did not alter. I did not alter, but he did. I did not swerve uh, from the straight and clear line. But somewhere, even Ms. Van Der Rohe, whom I admire immensely, swerved. <coughs> and he made a slight curve. <coughs> and I don't think it's allowed anymore. I don't think we are on the curve anymore. You know, I think maybe they were on a curve at some point. And, you know, on a curve, things look very exciting. You know, when you're with a car, you're seeing sort of, uh, you know, you've got this feeling that you're, you know, you, you, you know, a lot is happening in your body and kind of excitement. But I think we, meaning in general, the contemporary architect, uh, and I speak for myself primarily, is not on a curve anymore. Uh, it's, there, there's not going to be that feeling of exhilarated, accelerated uh, perspective. There's going to be just the notion of not being on a curve. In other words, seeing straight ahead all the way, uh, all the way, with absolute, clear, uh, unobscure thing. So uh, I, am tr I hope I'm communicating also this message uh, about the edge uh, of fire, that it's not a, on a curve. Next, please. And if it's not on a curve, uh, then one would need also devices, uh, which would certainly appear to be below eye level today. Since architecture, I believe, has fallen below eye, you know, has fallen below eye level. You couldn't see it, or one couldn't even recognize it if one saw it in front of one. It, it's, it's somewhere else, in another realm, and one would then have to make scientific, I use scientific advisedly, uh, scientific in, in the sense that one doesn't know, uh, devices in which to test the separation or the deflection of the language of architecture and its corporeal or you know, being. So this is uh, one of these devices, which I then built in order to pursue uh, that section, that line, that uncurving uh, of the circle. Next, please. And there is a perspective for Peter Eisenman. You know, I'm going to show it to him. You know, because uh, the perspective goes farther uh, than this faith in totality. Next, please. And it is, uh, as I said, about the sealing in, about the fracture, about putting everything into the, the molding, uh, the, the screw, uh, about uh, no longer having the drawing, to stop drawing. I actually, I have to say that's what I've done. I, I, in the last two uh, big projects that I participated, I've actually not drawn anything. Uh, because I think it's a dead end, you know, sitting and drawing. Uh, I know it's a venerable old thing, but it's for old-fashioned architects. And uh, one has to do, one has to get into the undrawing. But it's not easy to get out of drawing, especially if one has drawn for a lot. Uh, so, device. Uh, device also in the French uh, 17th century notion of device. You know, you wear a device, or it's not just a device, but device. Next, please. And now, uh, we are now involved in building the full scale of the device. Because the device uh, goes further than a model, obviously, of the device. Next, please. Next. And the device uh, actually contains uh, the 1001 letters out of which, uh, I mean, I think James Joyce finished writing, didn't he? I mean, he's finished with it. Uh, after that, you've got to know, you know, ancient Babylonian and Mesopotamian languages and the 
you know, all sorts of, you have to know all the languages because the, the Babelian motif is made up of 1001 letters. And I was particularly interested in the 1001 letters. So the device is actually to read architecturally the 1001 letters. Uh, next please. Uh, to read them architecturally means to, to try to <coughs> see whether any intersection is possible between this text and let's call it the geometric uh, below eye levelness. Uh, I'm not sure, quite frankly, whether they intersect. In this particular one, they intersect exactly where the viewer is, which means nowhere. I mean, they intersect in an empty head, uh, which is my own. Next, please. Uh, that's how I further pursued this one work. And next one, please. And one step further. And next one. And that's about it. I really try to do my best to communicate it. Uh, I know it's not adequate. It's hard to give advice when one needs one oneself. Uh, it's hard to give a formula, but if anything, I would only like to communicate that it's good to go far enough to get lost. And that's uh, all I have to say. Thank you. Daniel has uh, agreed to a few moments of conversation. If there's anybody who would like to uh, ask any questions or make any comments. Could you just comment um, shortly on what's available, what you know is available, and some concealed and model making for you? Because, you know, in this whole Berlin Cloud Park project, it's all models. And you know, the technique of making models. Yeah, book is a model. That's what I discovered. The book is a model. And uh, I discovered that book, uh, the book is empty. It's an empty model. And I guess I moved out of both, in your terms, model making as drawing and model making as model making. So I, I believe if you ask me what is available, I think a lot more is available. Which, uh, which can be documented and which can also be used to travel on this trajectory. I think uh, certainly we know from other societies that there are societies that did architecture seemingly <laughs> with not with these models. Uh, and I think I alluded to it before that uh, we may, might very well be, and I feel it in my bones, at the end of an extremely tedious tradition uh, and one should not uh, perhaps see it as something negative. One should see it as, uh, as having a liberating potential vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the quest uh, as architecture. And I think uh, a lot is available. Writing, rewriting, uh, mirroring, wearing the garment, wearing the crown, uh, having the inner face, looking into the inner face, having the, the limb, the limb, the limb of God. You know, th these are re remaining uh, possibilities for model making. Do you think there's any reason anymore for anyone, for me, uh, anyone who understands what you're talking about to read James Joyce or any writer in performance? Well, I can only tell you how I read James Joyce. I, I read him because I didn't, you know, because I discovered that my best friends, who are experts in, in Joyce, never read him. I mean, even Donald Vereen, Professor Vereen, who's the top uh, expert in James Joyce, I once asked him, he said he never really read the whole thing. I figured I'd read it without uh, worrying whether it means anything. And that's how I discovered what it means. 
I read it. I didn't worry about looking up the words and uh, finding out what it means. I read the whole thing. And I died as a reader. Now I'm free. I don't collect books anymore. <laughs> but, but, you know, I, I guess what I'm trying to say that, yeah, one has to read it. Sure. Well, Finn again. Uh, it's awake, isn't it? I think Joyce, uh, what makes Joyce so uh, compelling as a character is that he was reborn. And not reborn through consciousness, like perhaps Christ. I don't know, this is getting too far out, how people are reborn, but... point where you came so dangerously close to the mortal immortal point. I wonder if one really can stop so abruptly and say, well, the immortal just does not. I think it does, because it implies, it's implied. And it implies so much things that you do. And I wonder if it has to do with all the rest, like, you know, your book and so on. Because do we know? I don't know. No, I, I think that I, I only commented, no, I did not dismiss the immortal. I just said the mortal immortal. Uh, reversibility doesn't seem to be convincing. I, I just have how to say. How it can be convincing? Well, Do we have to wait for that it could become convincing? No, I'm not waiting for that point. So we don't worry about it. I'm not worrying about it. So it's Perhaps. Probably. But again, that's theory. To get it not into practice, but to live it uh, as an architect. And uh, I, I think... Uh, so yeah. Well, you know that advertisement uh, in America, I was just there, you know, if I had another life to live, I would live it as a blonde, you know? <laughs> you know, if I had an, you know, if I had another life, I would live it as an architect. Because it's highly doubtful to me, by the way, that architecture has been actually practiced. I think it's a lot of uh, suspect uh, associations that there has been so, uh, you know, history of art. I know this, this goes, uh, this, this is far, going far out, but I, for me, it, it's not too interesting, this so-called history of architecture, with all its, you know, power and glory and organization, because it is always for the one who wins. And I think it's now the time for the vanquished. I, I'm sorry to be sounding uh, perhaps more polemical than I want to, but it's time for the architecture not of the aggressor, but of the losers. I, I say this like that because I admire only the losers in the architectural field. Uh, really, I admire the losers. And uh, there have been a lot of them, but they were sort of forefathers. There seem to be more and more losers. And uh, for the loser not to take the aggressor's uh, point of view, for the vanquished never to take the values of the master, I think this uh, is something that I'm interested in, not to adapt uh, the values of mastery. And I've always wondered, for example, why in Latin America, when, when uh, Latin American Indians uh, ma uh, were, were ma massacred and exterminated by the Spanish, why they ever adopted uh, Spanish as a language? Uh, I think it was a bad choice. Uh, I think they, you know, anyway, I, I believe that's bad to adopt the language of those uh, who have uh, put you in bondage. <coughs> so maybe that's uh, some sort of an answer about uh, James Joyce. Yeah, I guess I meant the truth. Yeah, I, me I, I guess I meant that kind of truth. Uh, the kind of truth in the name of which one is operating. Uh, I think this is not something to be taken for granted. The truth of materials. The truth of the resources. The truth of the truth. I think it's something highly suspect. Uh, 
call it deconstruction, call it by any other word. It has existed for a long time. Uh, the, the, the ability to diagnose uh, the problem with the search for that kind of truth, which uh, usually winds up on the podium of academia or institutionalize itself in a appropriation of those who, whose truth it was. So uh, I guess it depends what, uh, in, in, name of, in, in the name of what truth one is speaking. I did not put myself in that position. I speak in, no, in the name of no truth. Because I don't know. And I think, uh, if I may just end this, I know it's, it's, that it's okay to admit, uh, it may not be impressive sounding, but it's okay to admit that uh, as an architect, one does not have the confidence. Uh, that one does not have the confidence, and yet one can still go on. The way scientists don't have confidence in what it all is going to. And I think most of them have dispensed with the idea that it's going towards the cosmos. Most scientists believe that it's not going to any place like that at all. Uh, but that doesn't stop them from working empirically and succe successfully in tracking uh, the miss the missed out or the, the sort of the holocaust of the knowledge which they are uh, implicated in. So uh, I think it's good time for architects uh, not to be masterful about what they do and not to master any longer their profession. Does anybody here believe that he really screwed a signed copy of the Mies van der Rohe book to the box? Did you really do it? Did you really screw the book? It's not his book. It's not his book. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.